So welcome to the talk. Um, we're going to be talking about automating, creating secure, disposable infrastructure for red teams, primarily using Terraform. This is going to be an interesting talk because I've acquired the conflu since I've been here. Um, so if you hear just random, really bad coughs while I talk, I promise you I'm not dying. Uh, it's just the conflu. So quick who am I slide because we got a lot of content to go through. Uh, my name is Marcello. I go by Bike Leader on the Twitters. I'm a security analyst at Black Hills Infosec, and I have a bunch of other certs which nobody cares about. So let's talk about, let, let's see what we're going to talk about. Uh, this is basically going to be a Terraform crash course and how to automate all the things infrastructure wise, at least red team related. But also, you could technically use the tool that we're going to talk about um, for DevOps purposes as well. What this talk isn't going to be is a base 62 infrastructure talk. Uh, so if you don't know what a redirector is, if you don't know what a C2 server is, this might not be the talk for you. Uh, there was another talk right after mine that covered the basics of this, but I think it was canceled, unfortunately. Uh, but this is not, definitely not going to be a basic C2 infrastructure talk. So we're going to cover things, uh, cover some things that are a little bit more advanced. So let's talk about what's Terraform, because obviously not everyone might not know what Terraform is. So Terraform is built by HashiCorp, uh, the creators of Packer and Vagrant and all of those awesome tools. So mainly Terraform is a tool for building, changing, and versioning infrastructure safely and efficiently. Uh, but you can really ignore the definition, because all you really need to know is it, you build infrastructure with code. And with code, I mean HCL, uh, HashiCorp configuration language. So this is a specific language to Terraform. Um, and after that, there's an execution plan. So when you run Terraform apply, for example, which we'll get into a bit later, it actually tells you what infrastructure it will go and create. So you don't mess up creating infrastructure before you actually deploy things. It also has the concept of explicit, implicit dependencies, meaning that if you set a implicit or explicit dependency, Terraform is smart enough to know that a certain resource needs to be created before the other resource that you specified is depend that it's dependent on. It also has a state file, which is, I think is probably uh, one of the most unique features uh, when it comes to these tools. Uh, Terraform distinguishes itself because of the state file. So state, the state file in Terraform keeps track of the created infrastructure, both that you deployed and both that you've uh, diffed. So, and we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Let's real quick dive into HCL, because there's going to be a lot of code in this presentation, but it's important that you understand um, the code in order to get a grip on the tool itself. So there are three main concepts in HCL. There are providers, logical providers, and provisioners. So providers are the things that you specify in HCL that go and interact with a remote API. So any cloud service provider, be it DigitalOcean, AWS, whatever you want. I think I lost track of the amount of API services that Terraform supports. I'm pretty sure at this point it supports basically anything under the sun. Logical providers, on the other hand, are the complete opposite. So logical providers are something that only exists in the code itself. And you can use logical providers to do stuff like create SSH keys dynamically or create random bits, for example, so that uh, there's no conflicting resources when you actually go to apply uh, your infrastructure. There's also provisioners. And provisioners is the fun part. Provisioners allow you to do stuff like execute uh, bash scripts on the created instances, execute commands locally, which is more useful than it sounds, and we'll get into that in a second, and all sorts of cool, fun stuff. So how do you get started with Terraform? It's actually much, much simpler than you'd expect. You create a directory, preferably with a Git repository. It is code after all, and that's if you don't uh, use Git in your code, that's a cardinal sin. Uh, var variables.tf, which is where you put all of your variables. Terraform.tf bars, which will basically be your file where you define values to your variables. And then do.tf, in this presentation, will be interacting mainly with DigitalOcean, just because it is very simple to understand, and there aren't really special things you need to do in order to get started. But the last file can really be named anything you want. So let's take a look at the code. So we've set our variables.tf file. We've populated our uh, variable, the other variable file. No, and that was weird. And uh, what we do in the do.tf file is we define a resource. So the really important part of this is the DigitalOcean droplet. 
So that is the actual name of the provider. So you define the keyword resource, you give it DigitalOcean Droplet, and now Terraform knows that you're going to be creating uh, a, a, re a provider with DigitalOcean Droplet, so you want to interact with DigitalOcean. HTTPC2 is just a common name we can give it. In this case, we're trying to spin up a C2 server, so this is just the name you can give that, that specific resource. And then we define our parameters underneath. So there's image, which is just the slug name of the image you want to create on that droplet, the name of, of the droplet you want to create, region, in this case it's London, size, two gigabyte droplet, that's all good and dandy, and the SSH keys. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. Then we go to the provisioner. So this is what you actually use to execute scripts remotely on the created droplet. So the provisioner in this case is named remote exec. There's a bunch of these. Uh, there's also remote inline, which you can use to actually specify a list of commands in the actual, um, in the actual code as opposed to running a, just a bash script remotely. And you need, in order for the provisioner to successfully connect to the created droplet, you need to tell it how to connect. So in this case, we're connecting via SSH with the user root, and then we're giving it the private key, which uh, we defined before. All right, so before, before we did all that, we basically defined a digital ocean SSH key. So as I said before, so there's a resource. In this case, it's named DigitalOcean SSH key. So if you give it a file path, it will then upload that SSH key to DigitalOcean, and it will be available to use in DigitalOcean. We're giving it uh, the name uh, DigitalOcean SSH key, and we're using a built-in function called file. And the file, as you might expect, the built-in function file, you give it a file path, reads it, and puts it into the public key variable. Okay, and the var ssh key variable here is something that we've defined previously in our variables.tf file. So we, we've managed to create resources on DigitalOcean with ssh keys and everything, but the thing is we're using the built-in function file, which means that we have to manually create the ssh keys before we want run that script which is bad because you know we want to automate all the things. So how do we do this? Also, you can't have multiple objects in DigitalOcean or really any cloud service provider with the same name because they do not like that. So you need a way to generate randomness in the name so that uh, DigitalOcean or really anything, AWS, doesn't come back to you and say, hey, this is not going to work. Stop it. So how do we go about dynamically creating SSH keys? and piping that into the DigitalOcean provider um, to then upload and then use uh, to then upload that stuff to DigitalOcean and uh, spin that droplet up. So the first thing that we do here is we define the random ID resource. And we give it the parameter byte length of four, so it'll create four bytes of randomness. And that will be used in order to create our randomness in the droplet's name. We then use the TLS private key resource, which, the, as the name entails, will generate an SSH key using the RSA algorithm with 4,096 bits. Now, this is the, uh, down here is the special part, because by giving the public key variable, the, TL, the previously defined TLS private key resource, we're creating an implicit dependency. And by that, Terraform, and with that, Terraform know, knows that it needs to first create the private key, and it needs to first create the public private key pair, SSH public private key pair, before actually going and creating uh, the droplets. But the thing is, this way, we don't really have our SSH keys to disks because they, if you generate the public private key pair through HCL, they will be only stored in the terraform.tf state file, in the uh, state file, which you could parse for this data, but it's really, really inconvenient. So what you can do is at the end of the DigitalOcean resource, you can put the local exec provisioner. And what this will do is uh, execute a local command. 
And the rest is really just string interpolation. So what it'll do when it creates the digital ocean droplet, it will take the private key and the public key and echo it to a file, in this case, data.ssh uh, data keys. So every time we create a droplet, those two public, that public private key pair will be outputted to the file system, which is great, which we can then use to document and actually SSH the droplet itself. What's also great is we can actually clean up after ourselves. So the local, we, do, we then define another local exec provisioner, and we specify on destroy. So when equals destroy means that that provisioner will only run when we actually destroy the infrastructure as opposed to creating it. And we give it the command to run. So in this case, we're just deleting the SSH keys, uh, which we previously uh, which we previously outputted before. So we've, we've got everything set up. How do you actually spin stuff up with Terraform? Well, the first thing you have to do is export a environment variable. Uh, the environment variable name itself is you're going to have to refer to the documentation of Terraform for each individual CSP. Uh, DigitalOcean is pretty straightforward. It's just DigitalOcean token, and you give it your DigitalOcean token. You then run Terraform in it. Terraform init downloads all of the required providers, uh, which are not installed by default on Terraform, so it has to go out and download them from the Terraform site. Terraform site. You then run Terraform plan, which will give you a nice diff of your infrastructure. So say, for example, you, you already applied this Terraform configuration, and you go and change something in it. If you run Terraform plan again, it'll actually create an infrastructure diff for you, and you'll know exactly what resources are going to be changed or not. And then you run Terraform apply, and uh, let everything loose, and it'll create everything uh, you want for it. So let's recap. We can now automatically generate SSH keys for our instances. We can spin our droplets up or whatever CSP you decide to use. And then you can run commands and bash scripts on the remote hosts or locally. But the thing is, this is really, the system really is inflexible. The reason for this is we want to create complex infrastructure, right? During red team assessments, you want redirectors, you want C2 servers, you want all, co all sorts of fancy stuff. And the only way you'll be able to do that is if in this, in this method is if you just keep changing the same Terraform configuration file over and over again. And obviously, if you want different kinds of infrastructure for different engagements, that's going to be a pain in the butt. So how do we make the system modular so that you have to only change very small amount of code in order to get uh, very complex infrastructure. Also, and as I said before, so as of right now, everything is in one configuration file. So the whole system is very inflexible. So it turns out there's these things called Terraform modules. And Terraform describes them as self-contained packages. But you can, again, ignore the description. Just think of Terraform modules as functions. So any programming language that you know, you can just think of Terraform modules as functions. How do you create a Terraform module? Well, you just create a subdirectory in your uh, root folder, wherever you spun up Terraform before. And a Terraform module consists mainly of three files. So there is a main.tf, outputs.tf, variables.tf. Uh, variables so obviously, the name is pretty straightforward. The main is where all of your main logic will lie. The outputs is the outputs of the module. So think as, again, like uh, referencing the functions uh, that, that's your function output. Variables.tf is the module input, module inputs. So think of it as arguments to your function. So this is, we're going to create a simple module that will spin up a HTTP C2 using DigitalOcean, right? So how do we do that? Well, we go to our variables.tf file, and we put in our arguments. So we got uh, the install argument. At, which is a type of list. We got the count argument, which is how many instances you want to actually spin up. The size, the region. So basically, everything that we've previously defined in our single configuration file that we did before, we now uh, have as arguments to the module. And this makes the system very flexible so that you don't have to keep changing the code, the HCL code, over and over again. The outputs contains the IPs of the instances. And the reason why. I did this. It'll become clear later. And also the SSH user. Uh, different CSPs uh, need different user names uh, to actually SSH into them. 
So because there's now Ansible support in Red Baron, which is the tool that we'll be talking about in a second that does basically everything uh, that I'm talking about here for you, uh, that is needed to actually SSH into the boxes. So we've got everything in a module now. We go back to our root configuration file. And instead of all of the code that we previously saw before, all we really need is this. So we define a module. Uh, the module name really doesn't matter. In this case, we're just calling it HTTPC2. The important part is the source variable. And that source variable is the path, is the local path to the module that we previously created. So now we completely automated spinning up AC2 servers securely. We can also run multiple scripts on the created service. So for example, if we wanted to install like Cobalt Strike, uh, everything that we, we want as an NSC2 server, we can totally do that. So now we need to take care of the redirectors, right? Because we have our C2 server, we want to obfuscate our C2 servers, we need to create something that can uh, automate creating redirectors. So this would be awesome. So say we had in our root Terraform configuration file, We'd ha we have two modules. We have a C2 server and a redirector server. What would be awesome if, is if we can just feed the IPs of the, of the C2 server to the redirector module in order for Terraform to automatically redirect all traffic um, from the redirector service to the C2 server. That would be great, right? That's like literally 10 lines of code. So is it possible to do that? Yes, it is. So in the redirector module, all we really need to do is define a redirect to variable, which is of a, of a list type. So what that variable will do is it will, get, uh, will, it will contain a set of IPs, which will be uh, RC2 servers. And then, basically, the rest of the code is the same. The only thing that we may want to do is actually use some kind of tool in order to actually redirect the traffic. So how do we do that? Well, in this case, we're using a different provision. So it's always remote exec, but we're using the inline argument. And the inline argument specifies the number of commands that we execute remotely instead of just a bash script. So we're, doing, we're installing a bunch of stuff here. Uh, the, really, the magic sauce is this final line here, which uses SOCAT to redirect port 80 to the C2 IPs, which we gave it previously in the actual root Terraform configuration. So now we have something like this, which is pretty, pretty cool. So we define in our root Terraform configuration, we define the HTTPC2 module. We give it the source, which is the, H which is the HTTPC2 module. Uh, count. So it turns out uh, the, all of the Terraform provisioners support a count argument, meaning that all of this stuff in theory can scale infinitely. So for example, if you wanted two C2 servers and 10 redirectors for some reason, you can totally do that just by specifying the count variable, which is great. And then we give it an install argument, which just is just basically a list of uh, bash scripts that are local on our machine that we want to install. And in this case, we're installing Empire, Metasploit, and Cobalt Strike, because why not? We then define an H the HTTP redirector module. We give it the source, which is the HTTP redirector module that we previously created. And uh, in this case, we're spinning up four redirectors, because why not? The redirect to argument is the most important, because we're basically telling it, hey, in order f for you to create the redirectors, you need to first create the HTTP, the HTTP C2 servers, right? So by specifying the output, uh, the IP's output of the HTTP C2 server, what we're doing is creating, again, like an implicit dependency. So Terraform now knows it needs to first create that C2 server before the redirectors. And also, we can specify different regions. So for example, if you wanted to just uh, spin up a droplet in, from Singapore or, in, or New York, you can specify the regions as well. And every uh, droplet will have a different region from that array. So it would be great if there's a tool that did all of this for you, right? Because I just talked about it now, but it would be kind of sad if you now went home with this and you have to build it all yourself. Well, it turns out I did, I did most of the work for you. So there's Red Baron, which is a tool that I wrote that does exactly this. And at this point, it supports 
it's a pretty mature project. Uh, it has documentation, which from an open source tool is pretty rare. Um, it has an exhaustive support of all the major CSPs, and also a lot of examples in the example folder. So if you just go to that GitHub link, there's an examples folder, which will ba is basically all you really need to get started. And it supports AWS, DigitalOcean, Azure, Google Cloud Compute, and Linode at this point. Um, the Linode support needs to be revamped just because there's an actual official Linode provider now for Terraform. Uh, so we're gonna, I'm going to have to work on getting that, um, getting that pushed out. Also, but also uh, I actually forgot to put it in there. It also supports the creation of Let's Encrypt certificates. So, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, now. Uh, because there's Ansible support too. So actually, just a week ago, I pushed out an update to Red Baron, which adds Ansible support to all of this. Dynamic SSH config generation, which sounds a little lame, but I guarantee you it's sort of a big deal because it's a key saver, and I'll demo that in a second. Also, how many people have heard of Mosh here? Awesome. Okay, so you probably should be using Mosh as your SSH client because it is at least 40 times better than the standard SSH client. It supports roaming. Uh, it has feedback. It has some sort of algorithm that I, I forgot exactly what it does, but it basically it predicts your typing as you type, which makes things incredibly faster, especially on latency-heavy networks. Uh, and everything is Mosh-friendly, so all the firewall configurations that it does uh, supports Mosh already. So let's, let's take a look at how it generates SSH config files. We give it the template file uh, provider which basically is used to create, as the name implies, templates. And we specify the path to the template in the template variable. We then create an explicit dependency, because there really isn't a way of creating an implicit dependency using the template file provisioner for some reason. And then all of these variables down here is what will be replaced with the, the same variables in the template file. So all of these values will be string interpolated into the template file as it generates it. But in order to actually generate the template file, we also need to tell Terraform when to actually generate them uh, because it doesn't, it, it's not smart enough to know that. And in order to do that, we create a null resource. Null resource is sort of a uh, weird Terraform uh, provider, but it essentially, as the name implies, does nothing. But it can be used um, on a lot of things because you basically can get around a lot of Terraform limitations and HCL limitations this way. So in this case, we're using a null resource to basically tell it to render the template that we previously defined on top whenever um, a SSH can, uh, an SSH key is, is uh, generated. So one of the big main issues that Terraform has is the provisioners, the remote exec provisioners, the local exec provisioners, aren't really made to do in-depth configuration on the hosts you spin up. So they're meant mainly to bootstrap the host so that you can then go in with something like Ansible uh, to actually do in-depth configuration and take advantage of all, everything that Ansible offers. But I really didn't want to do that in the sense that I just wanted something that just did everything uh, for me. So there's this awesome GitHub account called, which I think is the, one of the best names I've ever heard, Insane Cloud Posse. Um, and it turns out they managed to figure out how to uh, get Ansible to work with Terraform. And you do that by basically, and I think this is almost genius because I, 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 I could never figure this out. Um, so you're creating, again, a null resource. And we're telling it, hey, it depends on, in this case, the redirector code. So this will only, ha this will only trigger when a HTTP redirector, in this case, gets created. But also, it will trigger if the Ansible uh, playbook changes in any way. Because what it does is calculates the SHA-1 sum of the Ansible playbook. And if we modify the Ansible playbook and type Terraform apply, it will trigger on that so that it knows, hey, you've updated the playbook, and we want to go out and uh, configure something differently on those hosts. And then 
uh, in the null resource, we give it the local exec provisioner, which actually runs the Ansible playbook command. And this is just, again, I actually um, truncated this for brevity because this command, is, uh, this uh, line is actually really, really long. But you can see, you get the idea where it just does a bunch of string interpolation, and it gives it the private key of the host that it wants to, uh, that it needs to connect to, and the playbook, and all that good stuff. So, demo. Uh, this is, I'm going to try to do a live demo first. Uh, the internet here is really sucks, but uh, hopefully it'll work. But I have a video just in case it doesn't. Okay, can everyone see that? That is way too small. Hold on. Okay, this is going to look really bad because this Terraform is very, very verbose, but I'll give it a shot anyway. So let's take a look at our main Terraform configuration file. Okay, so this is sort of similar to the slides, but we have a HTTPC2 module defined. Uh, we gave it the Ansible playbook argument which is going to run the Ansible, uh, the specified Ansible playbook on all of the C2s that uh, you create. You could technically, as I said, like this technically scales out pretty well. Um, but right now, for just time constraints, we're going to spin up one server, one HPC2 uh, server. Um, and I'm not going to install uh, Cobalt Strike. This is an example, by the way, of, of just creating something with Red Baron in DigitalOcean. Uh, it's in the examples folder. So you can literally just copy and paste this into the root directory and you should, and uncommon stuff, and you should be good to go. Um, we then define the redirect to argument, which waits until uh, the EC2 servers have been created in order to pass that information to the redirector so that our traffic actually gets redirected. So now, we run terraform init. Okay, so um, when you first run this, it'll take a while, especially if you have a bad internet connection, but it needs to download all the providers. But from the output here, you see terraform init, uh, you got, it has the digital ocean provider, external provider, null, random, template. So these are all the providers that uh, are needed by the modules in order to actually create this infrastructure. We then run terraform plan. And what's great about the way the modules are set up too, which I d really didn't explain because of time, but um, by default, firewall rules are generated for each droplet. And when you run uh, Terraform apply, what it'll do is go out, get your current public IP address, and set rest um, input restrictions on the, tra on the traffic so you can only connect to the droplet and no one else. So it basically firewalls um, everything that you create by default to for and allows access to only your IP. So this is the output of Terraform plan, and it's a lot of output because um, like th the the modules itself contain a decent amount of code. Uh, the actual root configuration file does not, however. But you see here that we have it's going to generate a SSH config template. It's going to generate a digital ocean droplet. All of this stuff. These are all firewall rules right here. So it'll basically only allow um, SSH in from my current public IP address. These are the SSH keys that I'll be creating uh, and all of the redirector stuff as well. So let's see how slow this actually runs and if anything we could just play the video. So I'm running Terraform Apply now which will actually go out and create all of this infrastructure that we've set up, that we've defined in our root configuration file. And we say yes, we want to create all the things. And now it's doing its magic. Um, one thing that you want to keep in mind if you're concerned about it from a security perspective is that the actual SSH private key uh, that, you, um, that it uses is outputted to the terminal. There is technically a sensitive flag in order for Terraform to redact this, but for some reason it isn't currently working with the, some of the provisioners. So I still have to figure that out. Um, but you can see here that it generated the SSH keys, it generated the firewall rules, and it's now uh, trying to create, it is now trying to create the HTTPC2 server. 
And once it did ver and once it does verify that it's up, it'll connect to it via SSH and install a bunch of dependencies that we've set. So now the API, the DigitalOcean API got back to Terraform. It said, hey, the host is now up. So now Terraform is automatically trying to connect to the instance uh, via SSH. OK, connected. This is awesome. It's working. And now it's basically just running apt get install to install mosh, among other things, and just basic dependencies um, so that we can later install Empire, Metasploit, or Cobalt Strike. And SOCAT also. Awesome. So let's, while that it's doing its thing, let's take a look. So it created the HTTPC2 server. And this is just a bunch of, this is the, out, this is the actual SSH keys that it outputted to the folder. Um, and now, since we defined an Ansible playbook to run on the HTTPC2 server, it's actually executing Ansible now. So this is the output of Ansible. And the playbook that it's now executing is just uh, git cloning a bunch of stuff to the root directory. So it's doing that now. It's cloning impacket, CME. And again, this is an example that you can find in the actual repository. It's now trying to create the redirector. And it's installing a bunch of dependencies on the redirector. And it's also going to set up, it's going to run SOCAT in a Tmux instance so that it will actually persist uh, after Terraform uh, logs out of SSH on the host. Awesome. I can't believe this worked, quite frankly, on this internet. Um, so now we've created 15 resources, and everything seems to be up. So since we also generated the SSH config files along with all, the ho all of these hosts, we can make SSH tab complete all of the created infrastructure that we just set up using Red Baron. So if I now type SSH, and then let's see. So I think that's pretty cool, um, because that saves you an enormous amount of typing in terms of just specifying the, config, uh, the private key and everything that you'd normally have to do uh, when you spin stuff up. And there you go. So now we see we've successfully created uh, a redirector and a C2 server completely automatically um, with Red Baron. <laughs> and now to actually destroy the infrastructure once you're done with it. So once you're done with your engagement, type terraform destroy. It'll clean up after itself. Uh, it'll remove the SSH keys. It'll destroy everything that you previously created. Sweet. And we just, we've, take, we've cleaned up everything that we created. So I actually finished this quite uh, somewhat early. Um, but I want to give a shout out to these three people. So oh, let me put that back in presentation mode. I was expecting the demo to take a lot longer with the uh, internet. But uh, Rasta Mouse. Uh, he did an awesome two-part blog post on uh, initially setting this stuff up in Terraform, uh, some basic stuff with Terraform. And Red Baron was sort of inspired uh, by those two blog posts. Jared Height, who contributed uh, at the Azure modules in Red Baron. And also a gen gentleman or a gentlewoman of uh, the AF001. Uh, that's, his, that's his or her Twitter handle. Uh, thank you to her, him or her for... Uh, creating the Google Cloud Compute 
uh, modules. Any questions? That's a good question. So the question was, um, if you're on two separate engagements and you want to create two different kinds of infrastructure for two, both of those engagements, how do you do that? Um, so Terraform has an awesome command called workspace, which is exactly what you'd expect it to do. So you can basically, uh, if I can type, because I'm also doing this with one hand. So you can basically create separate workspaces, and I'm not showing that. You can create separate workspaces with the Terraform workspace um, so that your state files don't conflict with each other. And that's, yeah, after that, you're basically good to go. All righty, I think that's it.